What's up? CJ here. In this video, I'm going to talk about seven CSS features that you might not have heard of and might not be using, but you should definitely check out. Now, this was inspired by episode 784 of Syntax. Scott and Wes were answering viewer questions. Specifically, one viewer asked about CSS hyphens, and uh, both Scott and Wes had never heard of it. I hadn't heard of it either. And then there's also Overflow Wrap, which uh, Scott and Wes mentioned that they came across recently. So we're going to talk about those two. I'm going to show you some examples, but I also have five others that I think are pretty interesting and you should check out as well. So this first one is hyphenation. So let's say you have a container and really long words. If you say hyphens auto, the browser will automatically insert hyphens where it sees fit to make sure that your text fits with it within the container. Now, sometimes you might want to explicitly specify where the browser should insert those hyphens, and you can do that with ampersand shy semicolon. So this is known as a soft hyphen, and basically the browser will only show it if it actually needs to break on that specific area. So right here you can see I have hyphens manual, and this tells it to use these uh, shy hyphens or these soft hyphens that I have specified here. And you can see that it didn't insert the one in between Super Cali, but it did insert the one after Cali because it saw that it needed to actually insert that breakpoint. So if you ever want to explicitly specify where it should break, you can use these soft hyphens. Now, the other thing to consider is breaking based on specific language. Now, um, in this example, I have lang equals en on the paragraph tag here, and that tells the browser that this text is in English. So whenever we set hyphens to auto, it's going to break up those words based on the English language. It's not going to just insert them in random places. It actually has a dictionary that tells it the, the right places to insert uh, hyphens to still make sense. So for example, there's a, a dash after the ex, and squirreled, there's a dash after the squir and incomprehensibilities, it's inserting all of those in a, in a logical place. And that's because it has a dictionary built in for it. The browser also has dictionaries for other languages as well. So if you take this exact same text, but written in German, we set lang equal to de, which is Deutsch, Deutsche. And uh, if we set hyphens auto, now the browser is gonna use that German dictionary to break things in the correct place. So you can see that example, Bispiel is broken up in the same way, but these other words like Eichhorchen, which is squirreled, was broken up into three instead of just two. And Unverstandlichen, Unverstandlichen? I don't know. Um, was broken up in more ways than incomprehensibilities. Uh, so uh, browsers actually have language dictionaries to know when to insert those hyphens. So that works just by specifying the lang attribute on the element itself. Uh, now this has pretty wide support. It's part of baseline 2023, which are features that are heavily supported across all major browsers. 97% support, so you can definitely start using it today. The other feature that uh, Scott and Wes recently came across was overflow wrap break word. So in this example, we don't want to insert hyphens whenever we have text that's overflowing because it's a URL. And Inserting hyphens would make it like an invalid URL. So if we say overflow wrap break word, now the browser will break it accordingly uh, without inserting hyphens, but still fit it within the container. So this has huge support, over 97% support. You can use this pretty much anywhere. Now, this next one has existed for a very long time, but I find it interesting. And even I just came across it recently and completely forgot that it existed. But let's say you're a gossip columnist and you want to make your letters pop. With the first letter pseudo selector, this allows you to target the first letter of a given element. So in this case, we're targeting the first letter of every paragraph. We're changing the font size and making it italic. Uh, the other thing we're doing is setting the line height because without that, it uses the line height of the font size, but I want it to match the line height of the rest of the paragraph. And so, like I said, this has existed for a very long time, but I think it's pretty cool and it should definitely get more usage on like blogs and stuff like that. 98% support, you can use this in most places. Uh, now, this next one has to do with rendering images. So say, for example, you're rendering out some pixel art, and you can see by default, they look a little bit blurry, and that's because the browser is trying to smooth out the lines when it's rendering these images. But I know that this should be pixel art. So if you say image rendering pixelated, we're telling the browser how to render the image, and now you can see they pop a little bit more. It's a little more crisp because it's actually rendering out those pixelated edges. Now there's a few other things that you can do like crisp edges, pixelated, there's also like high quality. So basically you're just signaling to the browser how it should render the specific image. Uh, this has 97% support. You can use it across most web browsers. The next one has existed for a very long time, but I still come across people that have never heard of it. So let's say you have a container and we have a bunch of images inside of it. And so by default, all of these images, they have a width 100%, so they're just in a single column. The column count property will set the columns on the container. Boom, we instantly get a masonry-like layout. And this has nothing to do with CSS grid. It's not Flexbox. 
initially this actually was for like text on websites, right? Because you might have text that you want to split across multiple columns. And so this is literally the only property we need on the container to split it into three columns or four columns or 12 columns. Um, and it's pretty slick because it, it, like I said, it gives you that masonry like layout where all of the rows don't have equal height. It kind of just renders them out in order and then spaces them accordingly. Now, the one thing to note about this is the order is different than like CSS grid in that it's still rendering from top to bottom. So it's not left to right. So this is actually down and then back up and then back down. And you notice at the bottom, there's a little bit of like open space too. So it's not ideal for all situations, but if you want a quick masonry like layout, this is literally all you need. You don't need to bring any JavaScript or anything like that. The other thing you can do is like column span. So here I'm saying select every sixth image and it should take up every column. And now we have an interesting layout where every sixth image is kind of like a full row. So there's some, there's some cool stuff you can do with that. Uh, and there's other properties. There's like a column gap where you can specify how much space in between the columns. And then there's also column rules. So you can specify a line in between the columns and then also column width. So if you don't want to specify how many columns, you can specify width and the browser will automatically figure out how many columns to insert. Like I said, this has existed for a long time. It has almost 97% support. You can use this pretty much anywhere. This next one is aspect ratio. This is a newer one. It's part of baseline 2023. Uh, but this is really great for things like skeleton loaders. So if we take that last example, maybe we're dynamically loading those images and they're going to take a little while before they actually show up. I want the parent image container to take up the right amount of space. And we're doing that with aspect ratio. And so right now I have these hard coded, but you can imagine like you're getting this data back from an API. Maybe you have width and height and you can specify that aspect ratio dynamically, like with JavaScript or something like that. But basically for every one of these containers, I have the aspect ratio set to the correct thing based on the actual size of the image that's going to be rendered out. So now the container is always taking up the correct amount of space. And then finally, when those images load in, there's no shift in layout. Everything takes up the exact same amount of space that the container was taking up. So this is great for like responsive websites as well, because I'm not specifying a fixed width and height on that parent container. I can just specify the width and then the aspect ratio takes care of calculating the height accordingly. Um, and so this one is also part of baseline 2023, but you can do other things. Like if you do aspect ratio of one, that's going to make it a square. 16.9 is like horizontal video. You could do 916, which is vertical video. You can specify decimals like I was doing in my example. So it's pretty awesome. Now this has 94% support, still supported across all the major browsers, but a little bit less support than the others. Now this last one I want to show you is scroll snapping. So this is really great if you're implementing like carousels or like slides on a website. So you can see here that I have these div slides and they've been styled to take up the whole page. And if I scroll, you can see that I'm, I'm coming across all of the slides. But if we want presentation like functionality where if I scroll or I use the arrow keys, it jumps to the next one, we can use scroll snap. So the first thing on the scroll container, I need to set the scroll snap type. In this case, I'm setting it to Y mandatory because my scroll is in the in the Y direction. If you're implementing like a horizontal carousel, you would use X. And then for the elements that I want to snap, I can set scroll snap align. And for these slides, I'm setting scroll snap align to start. And you can see the moment I enabled it, it kind of jumped up. And so now when I scroll, it instantly snaps to the top of that slide. Just like that. And another thing you typically would combine this with is scroll behavior. So if I set scroll behavior smooth, now when I scroll between the slides, it's a little bit smoother. It doesn't just instantly jump to the next slide. This one's pretty slick. Definitely use it in your apps and, and remove some of that JavaScript that was doing that stuff before. Now, like I said, this is newer, so it only has about 94% support, but still supported across all the major web browsers. Now, that's all the features I have for you, but if you want to have your questions answered by Scott or Wes or myself, definitely go over to syntax.fm, click on Potluck, you can ask your question and it might get answered in a future episode. Now, I also want to mention that Syntax is brought to you by Sentry. They're an error monitoring platform. If you're running code in production and you're not using Sentry, you're flying blind. <laughs> and so Sentry lets you keep track of all of your errors. And it's really great. So if you want to try it out, go to sentry.io slash syntax. Use code TastyTreat for two months free. All right, that's all I got. If you have CSS properties that you use that you think more people should know about, let us know down in the comments. And then also let us know if some of the ones that I showed you was the first time seeing them and if you're going to use them in your apps. All right, I'll see you in the next one.